This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract one. Extract one questions one to twelve. You hear a podiatrist talking to a patient called Kimmy Potts. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Thank you for letting me know about your condition, Mrs. Potts. I've not had to remember so many details about my family in a while. Is there a reason why you wanted to know? So sorry. It's because there is one school of thought that intermittent claudication may have genetic causes, and I wanted to rule these out before we move on to the discussion of treatment. So wait, you think I have in inter intermittent claudication? But don't worry. The condition is manageable and treatable. And you think it's been passed down? Well, like I said to you, my mum's legs are absolutely fine, and I've never heard of my dad suffering from any cramps during the night. Is there anything else that could have caused this? There are a few causes. One of them being peripheral artery disease. Admittedly, it's a little premature in your case. All that means is there could be hardening of the arteries. From accumulation of cholesterol plaques that form on the inner lining of the arteries, it may also be caused by a blockage in the artery, meaning that your calves cannot get enough blood. The cramps usually follow on, and can be known as rest pain. It's usually the next stage. How long did you say that you've been feeling like this? A good long while now, maybe three months or so, maybe even longer. I didn't really think anything of it at first. I understand. But I'd like to have my diagnosis confirmed with some tests, and I'd like to do that as soon as possible. That's fine. I'm more than happy to do that. What kind of tests will I need? You'll likely need a scan to work out where the thickening or blockage is. You'll also need an ABPI. Oh wait, I think I've had one of those on the thirteenth of August. That's the one where they take images of the bones to see if there's anything that's. Broken, isn't it? Not quite. That was likely a routine X-ray. An ABPI is an ankle brachial pressure index to test the blood pressure differences from your upper limbs and lower limbs. Okay. What do I need to do for that? Can we have it done today? We can, but to start off with today, I'd like to test the circulation of your feet. This will involve me feeling for your pulses and using a Doppler machine to listen to them. This will let me know if they are monophasic, biphasic, or triphasic, or in other words, have one, two, or three audible sounds. Right. I'll then pass this on to the vascular team, and they can take it from there with all the other tests that need doing. Is that okay? Yes, I guess. I'm just a bit overwhelmed, is all. One minute I'm absolutely fine, going about my day as normal. The next minute I'm keeled over with pain that comes and goes as it pleases. Now you're telling me that I'll have 
to be strapped to machines and have pulses taken and Dopplers shaken. It's all a bit overwhelming, you know. I can understand that. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to go and see whoever I need to and have whatever tests that are necessary. It's just that I wasn't expecting this. I mean, I'm quite young, only 24, and I'm in excellent health. I've been eating a strict veggie diet for as long as I can remember, and I detox regularly. I wake up at 6 a.m. each morning so that I can do some exercise before work, and that includes Zumba and Pilates. Other than a short spell of diabetes in 06, I've never had any medical conditions or even any reason to go and see my GP until now. I understand. It's tough to take in, but understand that we're here for you. All of us. And I'm happy to book a review with you in two weeks to go over the test results with you. Don't worry, Mrs. Potts. Really. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Sally Winter. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Sally, you've been referred to me by your GP, and I've got your notes here. Uh, first of all, though, I'd like to hear from you what's brought you here today. Uh, could you tell me how your problems began, what treatment you've had, and anything else you think I may need to know? Uh, well, it all started about five years ago. I began to notice a pain in my arm, and it's gradually got worse. Huh? It's a horrible type of pain, a sort of tingling like pins and needles going all the way down my right forearm from the elbow. It's the inside part that's particularly bad and it occasionally affects my little finger too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've had to come and see you because it's got to the point where I can't work. I cycle for a living. I'm a delivery cyclist and last weekend I noticed I was finding it hard to use the brakes and when I turn corners it's agony. I just can't seem to grip things properly. It's having quite a big impact on my life. Huh? I mean, all of the hundreds of little jobs I do every day that I never used to think about now seem almost impossible. This morning I had to ask my son to tie my shoelaces for me. Hmm. My wrist feels so weak. It's ruining everything. I see. Uh, so what have you been doing to manage the pain? Well, I went to see my GP. It must have been about a year ago now. He suggested using ice packs and to rest the arm, so that's what I did. And it did work up to a point, but it's gone beyond that now. Mm -hmm. So then this friend of mine said I should try CBD oil, as it's supposed to be amazing for that kind of pain, and it is the best thing I've found so far. Okay. But if I know I'm going to be doing a big job and I need my arm and hand to work properly, I take a Panadol beforehand. I see. Uh, now, it says here on your notes that you went to see a chiropractor too. Uh, how did that go? Well, I only went once because it's expensive. <laughs> he gave me some funny exercises to do. I had to squeeze a tennis ball like this over and over. And the other thing he did was give me an elastic band and put it round my hand. Then I had to stretch it. Oh, and one more exercise where I had to lift a little weight up and down slowly. 
but it didn't help much really. Hmm. To be honest, I stuck to it for about a week and when nothing happened, I gave up because it felt like a waste of time. I see. Uh, is there anything else I need to know about? Any major illnesses or operations in the past? Uh, well, I had appendicitis when I was a kid okay. and two years ago I went on a climbing holiday in Spain and somehow I managed to pick up a shoulder injury there, mm -hmm. but otherwise nothing major. I've had a few bouts of depression over the past five years or so, like when a long-term relationship came to an end and then when my brother passed away. He had leukaemia. But I managed to pull round okay, because I'm very fit. I don't know many other women of my age who are in such good shape. And of course, I'm not overweight either. <laughs> no, you do look very well, Sally. What really worries me coming here is that it's all going to be a complete waste of time and totally ineffective. I mean, does physiotherapy even work? No offence, but I can't afford any more days off sick. If the problem's ongoing, you know, like a long-term thing, then I'm going to be in trouble. What I really want is steroid injections. Uh, well, a lot of people have doubts about physiotherapy, but I can assure you that it's an extremely powerful form of treatment, and you will see results if you commit to doing the exercises. Okay, but it'd be good if we could at least talk about some sort of surgery. My GP said I had to come and see you first. Uh, I, I don't think it'll even come to that. From what you've been saying, I'm confident that we'll be able to handle this with physiotherapy and over-the-counters. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a registered nurse explaining to a student the uses of a peak flow meter. Now read the question. Dr. Matthews wants us to monitor Lucas Young in bed 6 using a peak flow meter. Are you familiar with this device? I've seen them before, but I thought they are only used in special circumstances. In short-term monitoring, they can be very useful for a number of reasons. For example, if a patient has suspected occupational asthma, the peak flow meter can help diagnose or exclude the possibility of asthma. It's also handy in monitoring a patient's response to new medication, or in this case, a change in dose. In most cases that I've witnessed, they're used to calculate the trigger point for a written asthma action plan. I see. You hear an emergency department physician discussing a patient with a colleague. Now read the question. In bed 5, we have Jason Burgess, a 6-year-old boy, with a suspected accidental minimal ingestion of eucalyptus oil. His initial symptoms included mild CNS depression, drowsiness, and ataxia. On admission, his breath smelled very faintly of eucalyptus. At the time of the incident, his mother was in the bathroom where there was an exposed bottle of eucalyptus oil on the vanity. 
She was distracted only momentarily, but when she looked back, she noticed oil droplets on the front of Jason's shirt as well as on his lower lip and chin. She cleaned his mouth and changed his clothes and thought he was fine, but around an hour later, she noticed his change in demeanor. We need to continue to monitor his vitals and watch for any changes in his current condition. He's appeared more alert over the last hour, so it's looking positive, but we can't be too careful in a case like this. You hear a nurse educator briefing a student nurse about the importance of compression stockings. Now read the question. Compression stockings are specifically designed to apply pressure to the lower legs, helping to maintain blood flow and reduce discomfort and swelling. They fit very snugly to help the body's circulation, but that means they can be rather uncomfortable, so not all patients like wearing them. So does that mean all patients have to wear them? Not all, but we encourage their use for post-op patients and especially for particular conditions, such as Mrs. Jones in bed 6. Okay, so why is it so important for her? I was told they are very expensive. Mrs. Jones suffers from lymphedema, which is a chronic condition that causes swelling in the body's tissues, but particularly in the arms and legs. Compression stockings can help blood in the veins return to the heart, and a patient's health should never be compromised or impeded by cost-cutting measures. You hear an audiometry nurse talking to her colleague about a recent patient. Now read the question. I just had another patient who works as a bartender and now has noise-induced hearing loss. That's the third one this month. It's very common, but then it's their choice to work in that environment. Of course, but I doubt they go into it with the intention of losing their hearing. Surely the employer should be held accountable. Perhaps, but it's still a personal choice. Yeah, I guess. Plus, they earn more than us with all the tips they get. When was the last time we were given a tip for what we do? You don't expect to get tips, surely? Of course not. I'm just saying they get paid very well for what they do. They don't have to spend money studying, and they still do well for themselves. Yeah, true. But being paid well doesn't justify losing your hearing. I don't know. It seems like a fair trade to me. You hear a nurse giving instructions on subcutaneous injections to a patient. Now read the question. Subcutaneous injections are given with a very small needle that causes little or no discomfort. It's important to find a comfortable, well-lit working place to do the injection. Remember that preparations for each injection are as important as the injection itself. Plan to do your injection at the same time each day. Consistency is key. Make sure it's the medication your doctor prescribed and always check the expiration date on the vial. If it is past its expiration date, make sure not to use the medication. The same goes if you see any particles or discoloration. Just take it back and check with your doctor or pharmacist. You should get into the habit of cleaning your work area with soap and water. Dry off the work surface with a clean towel and then begin to assemble your medication, disposable syringe and needle, your alcohol swabs and puncture-proof disposable container. You hear two nurses at a training day discussing a lecture. Now read the question. I can't believe we just wasted 20 minutes listening to a lecture on how to deal with patients with a fear of needles. Didn't you find it helpful? 
Oh, come on. That entire lecture was aimed towards a student with zero experience. I know what you mean, but I found the tips on how to get them through it quite interesting, actually. Especially from before you begin, like watching their body language or asking them to lie down. I mean, some patients faint before you even touch the skin. Didn't you already know that? You've been nursing for years. It's so obvious. Of course it's obvious, but it's good to hear it, especially knowing I'm not alone in finding my patients with needle phobia difficult to handle. I think I should have gone to the respiratory review on lung sounds. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. hear an interview with a physician called Dr. Tadita Hussain, who's talking about treating patients with cystic fibrosis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Cystic fibrosis is a condition that causes mucus to be thicker and stickier than it should be. Dr. Tadida Hussain specializes in cystic fibrosis treatment and is here to share her thoughts on caring for people with the condition. Tadida, can you tell us a bit more about patients who suffer from cystic fibrosis? Absolutely. Sufferers tend to carry two to five times as much salt in their bodies as those without the condition, mm -hmm. so you can see why their mucus is thicker than average. Treatment for these patients is usually quite time-consuming and repetitive. Patients are often required to stay in hospital for long stretches. And as the symptoms...
symptoms of the condition begin to present very early on in the patient's life, many of my patients are young people. And so we tend to see lots of patients with cystic fibrosis finding these hospital visits frustrating. Right. In fact, throughout the UK, about 80% of patients with cystic fibrosis who are hospitalised report feeling at least minimal levels of depression. How about young patients who aren't currently hospitalised? What can be challenging about their treatment? Well, patients can be required to take around 30 pills a day to keep cystic fibrosis under control. So it's understandable that teenagers and young people who just want to be free and independent might resent this ordeal if they think they can get away with it. One of the most difficult things we have to contend with is the fact that if patients stop taking their medication or doing their daily breathing treatments, their condition won't immediately worsen. Instead, it will gradually become more severe until they contract a serious infection which puts their lives at risk. So what approaches do you use when treating patients with cystic fibrosis? Well, we've found distraction therapy to be extremely useful. We're incredibly lucky to have received a donation of a number of virtual reality headsets following their success in a number of treatment trials. We use the virtual reality headsets to transport the patient to outdoor settings, often corresponding to the activities they're required to do with us. When they complete breathing exercises on a stationary bike, for example, the VR headsets display a virtual outdoor bike ride. Our patients find it helpful to pretend to be somewhere else during treatment, and it's often easier for us to administer breathing treatments to patients using these headsets, as they're more relaxed when they're not focused on the actuality of the test. So, what sorts of changes have you seen in your patients as a result of these methods? One of my patients, a 24-year-old man with cystic fibrosis who was in hospital waiting for a lung transplant, well, he found treatment very difficult at first. He was preoccupied by his need for a transplant and frustrated by feelings of powerlessness. He would often resist treatment. We started using the virtual reality systems with him as soon as we got them, and it took a while for him to get on board. But when he did, it was like someone had breathed new life into him. Not only did he stop hindering his treatment, he actually began to look forward to it. He's even started helping us to think about other ways we can improve the experiences of our patients, like improving social interaction. Uh, yes, I understand that there are difficulties involved in patient communication. Mm. We're looking into the possibility of instant messaging functions between patients and even virtual games that they can play against each other. Unfortunately, patients with cystic fibrosis have to be kept apart to avoid cross-infection. It's just one more cross to bear for our patients, that they can't talk to those going through the same thing. Right. Our patients get plenty of interaction with myself and the rest of the staff, but we'd like to make sure they have access to a network of fellow sufferers too, for support and advice. I see. That all sounds quite futuristic. Are there any other advances on the horizon for the treatment of cystic fibrosis? Well, there's a new drug that's been in the news recently. It's a combination of Lumacafta and Ivacafta. You might know it by the brand name Orkambi. The drug works by improving the level of water and salt in the body, thereby reducing the thick mucus that causes illness and respiratory issues in those with cystic fibrosis. Even more exciting and futuristic, though, is the possibility of gene therapy where the genetic mutation that causes cystic fibrosis in individuals is replaced with a healthy gene. This would effectively cure those with the condition and significantly extend the lives of thousands of people and remove the need for lengthy stays in hospital. Now turn over and look at extract 2. Questions 7 to 
You hear a physician called Dr. Hubert Johnson discuss improving efficiency at a healthcare practice. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Hubert Johnson and I've been asked to speak to you about my experiences in the healthcare industry concerning something that affects all health professionals, improving efficiency. It seems to be a given these days that practices will struggle with a lack of efficiency. Uh, we've actually found that this expectation in and of itself can reduce efficiency and increase delays even further. In a recent survey, when patients were asked why they arrived late to their appointments, 30% said that they had assumed that the previous appointment would run long. Patients expect to be kept waiting, and to some extent, we expect that patients will be kept waiting. And so the first thing we need to address is our attitudes and the attitudes of our patients. So let me start by telling you about the efficiency I observed in a practice I visited a couple of weeks ago. At this practice, patients could not make appointments online, but they could either phone up or make an appointment in person. There were never more than two receptionists working in the morning, and the practice generally scheduled 80 appointments each day. Patients who were not attending a follow-up appointment were required to make their appointment on the day off. Can you imagine what that practice was like in the first couple of hours they were open? The receptionists were inundated by calls and walk-ins trying to schedule appointments. As you can imagine, patients who had seen what the practice was like in the morning expected that if they didn't have the first slot of the day, they'd be delayed by at least 10 minutes. So naturally, they arrived to their appointment 10 minutes late. One of the most important things you really must address in your practice in order to improve efficiency is the way you present your practice to patients. If they believe that you are always running late, guess what? They'll be running late too. Now, let's think for a moment about what needs to be done on the patient's end before an appointment can take place. You might be thinking that there are only two steps to the process. One, the patient books an appointment, and two, the patient arrives at the practice in time for their appointment. Well, we healthcare professionals often forget that there's actually a step that comes before this. Firstly, the patient must decide that their issue is significant enough to warrant an appointment. So, about a decade ago, my practice was really struggling from a lack of efficiency. I was working extremely long hours to try to accommodate everyone, and I was becoming increasingly frustrated with conducting appointments that didn't seem strictly necessary. I got to thinking about how I might be able to help patients to reconsider their initial assumption when booking appointments and to treat minor issues at home. At the same time, I did not want my patients to feel unsupported. I decided that I would begin to give weekly presentations in the evenings about self-care. As I tended to see a multitude of patients coming in for similar issues that they could actually treat themselves, each week I focused on a different common theme. 
The presentations lasted for just one hour, but I found that they resulted in seven fewer unnecessary appointments each week. These days, of course, I no longer have to give a physical presentation. Uh, thanks to modern technology, I simply upload instructional videos to our practices website. We also email these videos out to patients periodically. We can and should make use of technology as a tool in our practices to help us improve efficiency. However, it's important to note that while many, perhaps even the majority of your patients will be capable of using technology to arrange their appointments, there are many people uncomfortable or unable to use technology, so you must always make sure that these patients are accommodated too. Providing your patients with more options rather than replacing old options is often the best practice for improving efficiency. Now, let's move on to look at a practice that used technology in a surprising way.